and we should be adopting proposals that have been embraced and, ex and described for more than a decade, like compulsory licenses or voluntary collective licenses that would redress the harm caused by this sharing. Now, here's the thing to recognize. If we had had these proposals adopted a decade ago, what would the world look like today? Number one, artists would have had more money. Because, of course, artists haven't gotten any money from this peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Even when the RIAA has sued more than 20,000 people for downloading, none of that money goes to the artists. Number two, we would have an explosion in competition around business models for facilitating access to this new content, in particular, and a continued explosion in demand for broadband access. But the thing that's most important to me, as I see my five-year-old increasingly fascinated by what he can do on the computer, is that we would not have produced a generation of criminals. Now, we need to consider these alternatives now. Those are changes in the law. We need to consider now. Now, beyond the law, we need to think about changes in us. I think as a culture, we need to find ways to chill the control freaks among us. Right? And in the same context, learn to respect more the artists who are increasingly defining what creativity in this market is. Because if you look at the range of hybrids that exist out there, some hybrids are quite open to this new model. Some are very different. So for example, there's, an exa there's one kind of hybrid that I a little bit unfairly call a Darth Vader hybrid. The Darth Vader hybrid works by the hybrid company writing licenses that assign back to the company all the rights that are created in this joint activity between the sharing economy and the commercial economy. So it gets the name from my favorite example of this, a Star Wars mashup site, which facilitated kids 30 years after this extraordinary franchise had been released to take Star Wars video and remix it, remix it with their own music, their own video, share it with their friends. But if you read the terms of service to this Star Wars mashup site, you find that the mashup is owned by Lucasfilm. Indeed, music you might upload to that mashup site. Lucasfilm has the free right to exploit that worldwide for commercial purposes without any compensation back to the creator. This is a world where there are no rights for the creator, just being a little bit unfair, but it is Hollywood we're talking about. This is more like a share cropping arrangement in the digital age. Now, this is an important dynamic to focus on because increasingly among netizens, there is a question about the justice in this arrangement. Oh, Malik on his blog writes, does this culture of participation build business on our collective back? Whatever the collective efforts are, they are going to boost the economic value of these entities. Will we share in their upside? Not likely. The point these questions increasingly drive is the question, what is a just hybrid? And the answer to that question is something I don't think anybody in this room yet understands. But one thing I think we do understand is whatever justice is, it will not look like this. We need to develop a sense of greater balance in the way we relate to this sharing economy, less control, more open to this culture that there is no practical way to control. Now let me end with just one more story. I was asked to come speak at this place. This is the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. It was an event put on by this association where many people were invited to come understand creativity in the digital age. The room was this room, this beautiful room with red velvet curtains and red carpet. And the events had lots of different speakers. It was packed with artists, creators, and just some lawyers eager to understand how they could create consistent with the law of fair use. Now, if you know anything about the law of fair use, you know it has four separate factors that have to be balanced together to determine whether your particular use will be privileged under the law of fair use. So the organizers 
asked four lawyers to speak 15 minutes on each of these four factors, with the idea being that at the end of the 60 minutes, the whole audience would have perfect understanding of the law of fair use. But as I sat there watching this display, the reaction to the audience to this extraordinary exposition on the law of fair use was something more like that. And this led me into a certain kind of daydreaming about what this room reminded me of. When I was a kid, I traveled to the Soviet Union a bunch of times as in college, and I was fascinated with the dynamic of that place. And as I sat there looking in this room in the New York uh, Bar Association, I began to wonder when in the history of the Soviet system could you have convinced people inside that system that the system had failed? When? Like 1976 was wildly too early. It was still puttering along in a way anybody could actually believe it was working. 1989 was too late. If you didn't get it by then, you were just not going to get it. So when was it between 1976 and 1989 that you could have convinced people that this system, this ideal of a generation, had failed? And more importantly, what could you have said to them? to convince them that the romanticism of their parents and grandparents had crashed and burned, and to continue with the Soviet system, to continue to believe that the Soviet system in its same form should be continued, expressed a certain kind of insanity. Because as I, a lawyer, listen to lawyers around the world, but especially in the United States, insist Nothing has changed. The same rules should apply. It's the pirates who are the deviants. Well, they might be right about that. But pirates who are the deviants here, I increasingly recognize that this, too, is a kind of insanity. Right? The existing system of regulation we call copyright simply could never work in the digital age. Either it will force people to stop creating or it will foment a revolution against this form of regulation. In my view, both options are just not acceptable. We all need to recognize an explosion of abolitionism out there among our kids. A generation that believes that copyright was a great idea for the 20th century, maybe an okay idea for the 19th century, but certainly nothing that should be part of the 21st century. I am against abolitionism. I am a firm believer in the value of copyright, especially in the digital age. In this sense, I feel more like, uh, more like Gorbachev than like Yeltsin. I'm not trying for a radical revolution. I'm trying like a good old communist to preserve the old system in a new age. Yet, the extremists here are fighting against that balance. They don't want to preserve copyright. We need to work against both kinds of extremisms. Extremisms that will destroy the system that's essential for the creative spread of culture. Now, you might look at that not being lawyers, not being so concerned about the problems of copyright, and say, so what? So what if copyright fails? Not my concern. Let me give one final plea, then, to you. As you look at these technologies, as you understand them better than most in your community, you recognize we can't kill these technologies. We can only criminalize them. We're not going to stop our kids from creating in ways that we didn't create when we were growing up. We can only drive that creativity underground. We can't make them passive in the way that we were. We can only make them, quote, pirates. And the question we need to ask is, is that any good? Our kids live in this age of prohibitions, constantly living life in all sorts of contexts, against the law. And the fact we need to focus is that that life is enormously corrosive, extraordinarily corrupting of the basic rule of law in a democracy. If there's one lesson you take from this story, 
It is that we need a way to stop this war now. Thank you very much.